So I want to welcome you all. Um, the Center for Open Science is a nonprofit um, organization with a mission of uh, advancing open scholarship. And as part of that mission, um, we hope this conversation today will give you some insight into how um, some of the infrastructure tools um, that we build uh, help uh, uh, research communities um, in advancing open scholarship. So I'll, with that, I will turn over the conversation to Brian Nosek, who's the executive director at the Center for Open Science, and Jan Ole Hesselberg, who's the program director at one of our um, member uh, organizations, Stiftelsen Dam, who utilizes the OSF registry uh, toolkit. So I'll pass it over to you both. Thank you very much, Nadia, and thanks, Ion Ola, for joining us for this conversation, and thanks, everybody, uh, for being part of this. Uh, we have a shared interest uh, in making the quality and credibility of research the best that it can be, uh, because if research is a worthy investment uh, to try to advance the causes of humanity, then it's also worth doing well. And so how is it that we can uh, take the best of innovations and insights about how uh, research can be advanced to increase knowledge, to uh, find solutions, to offer treatments, uh, and what are the things that are emerging as ways in which the system of science and the practice of science uh, can be improved. We didn't uh, get from Sir Francis Bacon in the you know late 16th, early 17th century the full recipe of the scientific method that has remained static, uh, we, we know that there is no singular scientific method. There are many pathways to building knowledge. And one of the areas of emphasis over the last several uh, years has been a deeper recognition of the humanity that's involved in conducting science and the roles that the humans in the process play in trying to think and reason and understand uh, the things that they are pursuing, the process of discovery, and the challenges that the own limitations of our minds, our biases, our constraints of trying to discover uh, things could be perhaps addressed by some innovations and solutions like pre-registration uh, and the registry service, which is the topic uh, of emphasis for today, but can bridge into broader topics. So with that uh, general context, uh, and uh, what would be great, Jan Ole, is just to give us a first a sense of your organization uh, in, the, in the big picture scheme and, and what kind of work you fund, how you fund it, et cetera. So thank you for being here. Sure. Thank you, Brian. So um, yeah, my name is Jan Ole Hesselberg. And uh, I'm the chief program officer at uh, Stiftelsen Dam, Foundation Dam in uh, English. Uh, doesn't sound that good, but uh, that's the name. We all live like this in uh, Norway. This is in the middle of Oslo Center. Just kidding. Um, so uh, my journey started in the foundation uh, in 2016. Um, it's uh, uh, Stiftelsen Dam. It's a foundation, uh, one of Nor Norway's biggest foundations. We grant about uh, fifty million dollars a year to health research and health projects in Norway. Um, and my, I am a psychologist uh, by trade, clinical psychologist, and started to do research uh, in judgment and decision making. And there were two very important. Uh, papers that affected uh, how I thought about developing the foundation. So the first one was a paper that came out in The Lancet in 2009 by Ian Chalmers, one of the founders of the Cochrane collaboration, and Paul Glacier. Um, they claim that 85% of health research is avoidable, uh, avoidably wasted um, and had some really sound arguments as to why that number is so high. Um, and then your paper, actually, um, uh, Brian, the reproducibility project um, that showed uh, that a lot of um, social psychology and personality psychology um, research uh, is hard to replicate. 
So uh, as a science, as a research funder, that's uh, those two papers, I would say, are um, nightmares for a funder. We really want our money to be well spent. And it's obvious that uh, although a lot of research is uh, of very high quality, a lot of it is of poor quality uh, as well and is avoidably uh, wasted. So um, that's how we started to try to focus on how, what can we as a funder do to, to limit research waste and uh, um, more um, uh, more particularly uh, limit uh, the uh, uh, questionable research practices like piaking and harking yeah so uh, that that contribute to the problem of um, of uh, wasted uh, research yeah well so thank that's, you that's a short uh, start here and uh, I think we made some sort of, um, a lot of leeway here in Norway. We, we were small enough to make be able to uh, really put this into focus and be uh, unpopular uh, sometimes. Um, and we see now that uh, some of the big funders are starting to follow uh, some of our practices. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that uh, context and sort of big picture connecting the notion of research quality and reproducibility of the findings with the the mission of the organization it's clear that they're that that notion of waste like if we're going to spend this money uh, we want to make sure we get some return uh, on that investment uh, so might as well try to find ways to improve it um so can you sort of unpack a little bit you started at the end of your comments of referring to terms that may or may not be familiar uh, to everyone, yeah. p-hacking, questionable research practices. Can you unpack a little bit sort of what the core challenges of that lead to waste uh, yeah. and opportunities to improve that you see of having a role as a funder and trying to trying to redirect and shape? Yeah. So I would say there are two, uh, from my perspective, at least, I would say that, uh, the way I read the research, there are two main problems the uh, the biggest problem is just um publication bias that there is a lot of research that's initiated and that that is never published so i i i recently took part in um uh, in a study uh by a stanford group looked at all nordic clinical trials from 2000 registered as ended from 2014 to 2019, I believe. Um, and we found that uh, about 22% of these clinical trials never have never reported any results. Mm. So uh, they're just they're just gone, probably for eternity. And it's about 80,000 people, uh, patients uh, included in those trials. Um, and uh, the problem is that the problem is really not the missing trials. It, the problem is that these missing trials have uh, um, are not randomly selected. They have some attributes that are different from the published trials. So they have there are um, more side effects in those uh, unpublished uh, trials. There are uh, more dropouts among patients. Um, there are more negative results. So um, they uh, they distort. So the missing trials uh, contribute to a really bad distortion of the evidence, the published evidence. So that's that's one of that's the main problem I would uh, would say. Um, and it's still very prevalent, even though we have known about this for a long time. It's uh, prevalent in the most rigorous trials we have, the, the clinical trials. I suspect it's even um, it's uh, worse in other kind of trials. So, uh, and the other one, in the other problem is similar, and that's just um, uh, missing parts of the results. So, or changing results. So you 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 do ten tests, and you report on six of them. 
uh, you have 10 outcomes and you report six of them and it's not it's not uh, random what what the re uh, outcomes are reported and uh, uh, um, uh, those that are not reported so um so I believe those two are the main problems and there's a lot of technical details also you can do uh, you can do selective reporting within the single outcome as well you can remove some data points and stuff so we have too little control and I believe uh, researchers uh, sometimes do this deliberately uh, sometimes they have really good arguments as to why they shouldn't uh, publish uh, outcomes and why they should uh, remove data points and and things like that. Um, but the, the problem is we have too little control and we know that the research, uh, the evidence is biased because of it. Yeah. So that's you. what we have to fix. And we need, we need a digital infrastructure that can help us avoid it. Yeah, that, that was a great summary of two real deep challenges, the uh, publication bias, especially the ignoring of inconvenient or negative information, and then that selective reporting of what researchers are doing interactively with their data, but only a few of the things get reported at the end, with the consequence of that being the things that get reported end up being an exaggeration of the reality of the actual evidence. Uh, because if it's only the positive results that get reported, then everything works. Look at we're yeah. we're solving every problem. And the actual negative studies that say, well, maybe not, uh, are missing, are gone, uh, as you described. Yeah. And, and I, I just want to oh, please I just want to add, I've I've really seen the consequences of it because I'm I'm within the field of judgment and decision making. And I, I've mm -hmm. done a lot of talks of, of about the results from uh, those kind of studies and i i used to have like uh, i used to have social priming as one of the things i really reported on small small tweaks you can do in the environment around people and then they re behave in dramatically different ways uh really popular findings but now we know that those findings are likely to be very uh, exaggerated at, at least so that's um it's been hitting us really like a sledgehammer, I would say. Right. So then we're, we have false confidence in the findings as they are. Then we start to invest on the extensions of those findings, but without really understanding their reliability. And so that investment may be totally genuine and well done, but based on not solid information. So it ends up uh, being wasted as well. So they sort of compounding challenges without getting the core of that evidence base right. Yeah. You also signaled Anything, something. Yeah. Please go ahead. No, and it, and, and that you what, the the cascade effect. Yeah, uh, explains why the the numbers are so dramatic. Eighty five percent is avoidably wasted. It's hard to believe when you hear it, uh, but it's uh, the it's a result of what you're you're describing there that you're building on previous um, uh, non solid research. Right. Right, because if a preclinical finding is not actually reproducible, but it ends up prompting an investment in a clinical trials uh, pathway, then all of that ends up just being, no matter how rigorously it's conducted, ends up being building on a false lead that could have been caught earlier. Right. You mentioned something at the end also of sort of the, we don't know about it, like people are making decisions, maybe they're justified decisions, maybe they're not. But the key, it seems, is that we know what those decisions are, that it's available to the reader uh, to be able to understand how I, as the author, made these decisions so that you can say, well, that's sensible or, or that's not. <laughs> and I want to be able to see uh, some of these others. Uh, and so the, the solution, you know, having some public infrastructure to make all of that more available and accessible for scrutiny uh, is a key factor in uh, advancing those solutions. And so you have adopted the OSF registry service. Uh, can you tell us how that fits in to addressing the challenges and opportunities as you've described them? Yeah, so um, I believe we started in 2018. We demanded that all our uh, all the trials that we fund have to be pre-registered. So we started, uh, we started with really with the randomized trials and observational trials. 
and we said uh, you can register where you want in the eu database or in clinicaltrials.gov or osf um and then uh there's a value to us as a funder to to just uh gather our projects in one place so that we get an overview of our projects and and a workflow where we can uh, check um the registrations of our projects uh and that's where osf came in um uh it started to we saw it started to get some traction and it had some good templates for different kind of uh of studies or trials um so we just decided to make pre-registration um a requirement for all our trials even even the uh, qualitative trials that we fund um and to say that they, they should all register in at uh, the osf and then we move to the registry where we can uh, where we can screen the registrations before they become uh, public and make sure that all our projects um, uh, register there okay and can you so i just want to so i want to add that so so we we have our own um system i th i believe we spend about we have our own application system we we spend about uh, maybe two hundred thousand dollars a year uh, maintaining that system, but it's it's isolated from the rest of the world, so uh, it's not some uh, somewhere where other researchers can come and comment on the ongoing projects um, uh, and scrutinize the projects that we fund. So that's one of the. That's one of the benefits of OSF as well, and uh, we realize that we're we're not able to uh, we're not able to be the ones developing uh, a system that really should be just a part of the the scientific uh, mm. international infrastructure. That's that's where you come in. Yeah. Someone has to do that uh, for us. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Uh how how it fits in and maybe just to make the connection explicit the role of pre-registration we can describe for those two key challenges you mentioned publication bias and questionable research practices or selective reporting in the work what pre-registration requires of the author is pre-commitment i am going to do this study and here i describe the things that are going to be in my study uh, and I'm going to analyze the data and identify my primary outcomes. And here are the ways that I'm going to analyze it. So the way that that pre-registration process then uh, addresses publication bias is that it creates a record. This was my plan. This is what I was going to do. Now that's discoverable. Even if it doesn't end up in the published literature, it is there. And then the second part is it makes very clear what things were planned beforehand and what were discovered after the fact to address that selective reporting of, yeah, report what you're going to report, but let's make it possible to see what was there in advance. So when you're using that registry, how does it, you, you mentioned you, you're checking this, how is it fitting into the workflow of grant management, of, of giving grants, of monitoring compliance? How is it that you know what resources do you need uh, to to operate this effectively uh, for for the organization? Okay, I would say that that depends on where you yeah where you put the bar. Um, mm -hmm. So our process is uh, we have an application system. P people submit uh, proposals to us. They are reviewed by our experts, and then they are granted or rejected. And then when you get the grant, we say. Now you have to register your project at the OSF in our registry. Um, they fill out um, a template uh, for registration um, suitable for their project. So if they have a qualitative research project, they use another template than if they have uh, do a randomized controlled trial. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a person screening those uh those uh registrations and what she does is 
uh, is not really diving into the details of the study. She's just making sure that, okay, is there an hypothesis there? Are there some outcomes there? Um, how are they formulated, the outcomes, uh, the analysis, the plan for the analysis? So she really just makes sure everything is in place. She doesn't, what she doesn't do is look at the proposal that we got and match mm -hmm. that up to the pre, the pre registration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I would say that's a fairly low bar. Um, so she, she does not spend a lot of time doing that. So then we leave it up to the scientific community to to make sure that uh, that's enough, that's that uh, the reg pre registration is accepted then by the yeah. the journal that uh, assesses the the um, publications coming out of the project. But what we ideally should do, I would say, if you put the bar high, then you should have the reviewers uh, from the proposal process. Uh, application process come in and check that they are doing what they said they would do uh, when applying for funds um, because I suspect there are quite some changes uh, in the projects yeah yeah and sometimes that kind of change is a natural uh, when you go to implement you realize Absolutely. oh we, we propose to do this but there's no way we can get that done uh, but yeah. it would be nice to have some substantive dialogue uh, with other experts of whether the choices now that I now make uh, are ones yeah. that are effective. So the best thing for us, the the absolute best thing would be to have an application side uh, of the uh, registry as well, so that you mm. submit your the your uh, registration is really your your proposal to. Proposal. Uh, to us yeah yeah and then structured in precisely how it's done so that you would then engage reviewers right at the outset with the pre-registration yeah yeah so that would i would say that's probably ideal but it's uh it's hard to get to as well because there are so many different needs right uh, at the funders right but it sounds like from what you have constructed to date it is you're not trying to bring in-house the substantive critique. You're still using external reviewers for that. And then once it's registered, the community to assess the core is, are they actually following through with yeah. developing a plan and transparently reporting on that plan? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so how are grantees reacting to this? Um. I would say there. Uh, that I would say if I could, uh, um, uh, if I should just pick one reaction, I would say <laughs> they they are really delighted. For, uh, they are very positive to uh, to uh, towards the project. Um, they say they see the problems within research and that. Uh, OSF is a nice, uh, good solution, one of the solutions, but that it doesn't fit my project right. uh, quite uh, quite well. So we we've gotten we've gotten some pushback. Um, usually it's it's fine. They just do what we uh, we expect them to do. Uh, but some we have some pushback. Sometimes it uh, they are uh, good arguments. Uh, Sometimes they are not. We've we've gotten a lot of pushback on demanding this from our qualitative projects. Sure. Yeah. So uh, so the argument goes that yes, but the the qualitative project it develops. Uh, it is a process more than than a pl uh, planned uh, study and can't be compared to to a randomized control trial. And of course, they are two very different ways of gathering information um but i would say if your plan is if you say to the world i plan to interview 20 people and then do this with the interviews and then in the finished paper it they are there are five interviews um it's relevant for the reader to know 
what happened along the way. Did you do more interviews than five? Uh, or didn't you have time to do the remaining 15 interviews? Where are those 15 interviews if they were done? Uh, so I, I believe um, uh, it's just it's just valuable information in interpreting the results uh, anyway. Yeah, that's a great example of a general concept, pre-registration of making pre-commitments in advance and then discovering what changes after the fact. How does it translate to be an actual benefit in different areas of scholarly research? And qualitative research is really a, a, a leading edge area of trying to understand how these concepts of planning in advance and making commitments may or may not be applicable uh, to different parts of that scholarly process. There's a great uh, work by Tamarinda Haven, uh, who developed the qualitative uh, template for that's on the OSF of working with many different qualitative researchers across fields of trying to figure out what is it that should be reported exactly as you're saying, uh, that are things that we that can be planned. In all, in every area of research, not everything can be planned because it's research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we find out once we get in there, oh my God, this is so different than what <laughs> I can see. Uh, but the ideal, I think, is exactly as you're describing, which is that as you get into the work, things that change ideally become transparent. We have these yeah. expectations and these are this is what actually happened. And it doesn't yeah. mean that those changes are wrong in any way. No, Sometimes no. they're the best thing in the world. Uh, yeah. But- the fact that they changed is relevant for the reader. Right? Yeah, yeah, and I, 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 um, I really believe that um, uh, it would help researchers as well just to keep track of those changes. But it's because it's really, really hard to yeah. uh, remember what you planned and uh, and uh, the changes you, uh, if the changes you make on the way um, along the way uh, are a deviation from your plan or not. So. So having having a tool to to help researchers just track those changes, I I believe would be of great uh, help. And also, um, I've I've been uh, I've done some research, not a lot, but some research, and I've been sitting in discussions with my supervisors, for example, where they suggest uh, changes uh, that I'm not comfortable with, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and we discuss. Maybe they are right. Maybe they are, uh, are wrong. But it's. Uh, I think it's a lot better for the the candidates doing the research, or at least the students, PhD students, for example, to to uh, uh, be a part of a system where those changes are tracked. Yeah. So you really, you really don't have to. Yeah. yeah so so you know that if that decision is made uh it will be visible so you're not it's i would probably think that it eases some of the burden of the the students in yeah. discussions with more senior uh, researchers as well right yeah that's a, a general truth right explicitness having things written down <laughs> helps to navigate uh relationships especially power relationships yeah. uh, where we say look this th this and what can I tell you? We wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, we can make the change, but let's be clear that it is a change. And you know, and yes, you have more power than me, but uh, we're still going to yeah. have to be, uh, you know, accountable uh, to what we said uh, at the outset. Exactly. Yeah. I you you mentioned that the different types of pushback, and I have such great empathy for the the researcher experience in wading into pre-registration, because when we started doing it uh, in my lab, one of the experiences in trying to create a plan was yeah. the recognition that this isn't actually how I thought about the work at all prior to doing yeah. this or how the yeah. work sort of played out. Like, how do I figure out how to analyze my data if I don't already have my data? Yeah. And it sort of you know, it hits me like, Oh, that's the problem. Is so yeah. I was figuring out how to analyze my data <laughs> yeah. as I was analyzing yeah. it. That's why yeah. all of these questionable practices emerge. But it is disruptive, right? It, yeah. it to have to work through this stuff at the outset is is not easy. No. Uh, so yeah. what? Yeah. So t what kind of ways of supporting researchers in 
developing the capacity for this is is needed. No, I, I really think I just how you meet them. I think it's really important. You said with empathy, because it's uh, it's this is really uh, starting uh, yeah. this uh, this uh, way to think about uh, research, and it's it's really hard, and uh, and the infrastructure is not really in in place, and. Uh, uh, and a lot of the senior researchers in different fields are have not done research this way in their career, so they they're used to doing it in another way. And then you have uh, junior researchers meeting with funders trying to push this uh, field forward sometimes. Um, and it's uh, and it can be really hard. So I think you you should meet everyone with with empathy and say, I know it's hard. It's uh, we have to figure out this together and give them some leeway in the start uh, also and and try to uh, try to feed the information back to you, providing the infrastructure and uh, yeah, just have an open dialogue uh, of of these things. Yeah, I'm doing a. I'm doing some peer review research and I'm I'm gathering huge data sets from the Norwegian Research Council and different other Norwegian funders to see what factors um, are associated with disagreement among reviewers looking at the same proposals. It's a huge data set, uh, maybe 300,000 reviews and and I'm so frustrated uh, trying to write this pre-registration because it never seems to end where <laughs> where does it end where i describe how the analysis are done and how the data is transformed where, where should i start right uh and should i provide the the r script in detail what happens if it doesn't run with the finished data set it's it feels like really, uh, yeah, it, it never ends. There's right. always more details more, uh, that's yeah. possible to add. Yeah. Right, right. It's always possible to do it better. Uh, mm. And so, yeah, my mantra for this is, has been incrementalism. Like, let's do yeah. a little bit better today than we did yesterday. And yeah. pre-registration, because it's unusual and disruptive to the everyday workflow of many researchers, it does create times practice yeah, you're developing a skill we wrote a paper a few years ago called pre-registration is hard and worthwhile uh, mm -hmm. and it really tries to articulate this is going to be a challenge it's going to be something where the first time you do it you're going to have fits and starts and you get through the end and then maybe you'll look back and say oh why didn't i do x or i can't believe we didn't think of doing y because of course those are decisions that we make later uh, but it's the the practice of doing it that ultimately sort of yields the, I, oh, I see the benefits. Oh, my gosh, doing more planning yeah. makes my studies better, makes it more likely that they're publishable, regardless of what turns out. All of those things that are surprising uh, after having done it. I remember yeah. this one conversation with uh, uh, someone who came up after a, a lecture, and he said, you know, I I, I, I was not on board with pre-registration. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, but I saw you give a talk. And so I said, all right, I'll try it once. And so I pre-registered my study and I forgot about it. And I went and did my work and then I'd analyzed my data. And then I remembered that I had pre-registered it. And so I went back and I looked at my pre-registration and my analysis plan was totally different than what, how I analyzed my data. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I I d didn't remember that that was my original plan. I thought it was this other yeah. thing. And so he was a total convert because of the actual, just the experience of doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was a fascinating uh, how we can lose so much of the context in the everyday rough and tumble of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This kind of process can actually help with. Mm. Yeah. So the other part of sort of your signaling a couple of different times is the the value of reviewers in engaging with the substance. And we mentioned before the call when we were organizing uh, our thoughts about what to talk about, you mentioned that you're also doing things with registered reports uh, in order to try to bring some of this review process uh, and the expert engagement in line with pre-registration. 
So maybe you can just give the you know the quick what registered reports are uh, as distinct from pre-registration in the registry, and yeah. then what you're doing with that. Yeah. So uh, registered reports uh, is really a. Uh, you correct me, Brian, if I'm doing this uh, <laughs> wrong. Yeah, <laughs> I know you. I know you have heard about the registered reports. Um, so it's uh, uh, really a publishing format where uh, the uh, journals receive the uh the uh protocol or the you call it a pre-registration a description of what is done uh the methods uh, of the study and then when they uh, uh review the the methods and decide it's uh, worthy publishing they commit to publishing the final uh final um article um when it's done and if it's done according to plan or if you have good reasons uh, to deviate um so it's uh, you get an in principle acceptance uh before you start doing your uh, data collection and analysis uh so it's really just connecting uh the th the the principle of pre-registration to the to the peer review process uh, in the journals um and yeah, we so just are to connect yeah. before you continue the so that addresses publication bias that happens at the journal level where they say well we don't want negative results or things that are messy or inconvenient even if that's the reality by getting yeah. the journal to pre-commit to publish regardless of outcome it solves that problem uh at yeah. someone separate from you the journal and how their, their role in the process and the other thing that you were highlighting there is it engages that expert review at a point in time where it actually can improve the research. In the standard journal model, all the research is done and you've submitted it to the journal for review. And what the reviewers do is say, here's all the ways you screwed up the research. Too bad. Uh, it's too late now. Yeah. Whereas in the registered report model, they say, oh, your plan is interesting, but you really could improve it at X, Y, and Z. And so yeah. it actually makes the research better. Uh, by engaging experts early. So, sorry, yeah, those are great. So now, how do you use this? Because this is something that journals do. Yeah, so what we have in uh, at our, um, we've been doing a lot for a while in um, our foundation, we have a two-stage process when you apply for funds to us. So you submit a sh very short pre-proposal, and then we have five different reviewers uh, looking at the proposal independently. And based on that score, the best one uh, best ones are invited to a second round where they submit full proposals so uh that saves a lot of time we know it, it the the average uh, applicant uses half the time now compared to before when we just had full proposals right so uh what we have decided this year is that when you when you start on the pre proposal you get the choice you can either choose uh, tra our traditional process that I just described, or you can choose a uh, registered report. And if you choose registered report, we say that we guarantee you a higher success rate than if you use the other route. And also, uh, this pre-proposal is the only thing that you submit to us. So uh, mm. if you are among the highest uh, ranked pre-proposals uh, that shows registered report, you will get funding for your process, uh, for your uh, for your project, provided that you find a journal that will publish uh, your, uh, your uh, project as a uh, registered report. Oh, so the, from the author's perspective, this is saving me some time because, yeah, I, the pre-proposal, that's great independent of this, right? I get quick response on low effort. But then if I choose the registered report route, then I don't have to go through your peer review process for the full proposal and the peer review process yeah. journal uh, after I do the research. Now that's essentially combined into one. Yes, review. yes. And I, as it should really, I mean... Because it's it's really with the, the the functions are really similar. Yeah, assessing yeah. the quality of the research. Yeah. So how how does budgeting work then? Uh, how because they can't go to the journal and say I want a 
10 million uh, dollar um, no thing. no um so they 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 tell us in the applicant pre-proposal form how much money they need um and if they are granted we we say we'll we'll guarantee you that that sum and we'll also give you fifteen thousand dollars to write up the the um what's it called the phase one the um, uh stage one paper? the stage one uh article or the yeah okay. the description wow. of the methodology that's great um so and then after that they will get uh the rest of the funding if okay. they are uh, accepted by the uh, paper yeah okay so great. the problem the problem will be if the reviewers at the journal say no you need double the participants uh that will be a problem because we have no more money to give that project right right and so in have have scenarios like that come up yet or do you have a sort of a feedback loop plan for how to manage that or sort yeah of, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll do an ev evaluation now this is the first time we do it and the um, deadline the application deadline is 15th uh, of february oh. so we're really excited to see right uh see okay. as of now 15 percent of the applicants have chosen registered reports wow so that's wow. that's a good sign uh, yeah I think. and yeah. and are these uh, I would i'm just gonna interject please. sorry one second brian because we we only have a couple of minutes left and we do have one oh, question yes. i want to make sure yeah. that we got to um from nicholas gibson um who has asked uh, have you encountered any downsides or challenges to locating all of the dam funded projects within a specific registry so for example how do you handle research that's co-funded with another funder um if that's an issue at all um uh, that's not a huge issue at our end because we only we demand to be one of the largest funders so uh, and it has to be a new project so it hasn't I, I don't believe that uh, has been a problem one okay. thing i can say that's related is that uh, and that's probably an area for development at the osf as well is getting data out of uh, out of the uh, registry to get an overview uh, of uh, of the projects ongoing projects um, connected to one funder yeah so better reporting mechanisms so you can see it all in big picture yeah yeah and and getting data out in uh, in excel files and yeah different formats great Great. So maybe so that we can wrap so that we can go to uh, any other Q and A. Maybe this is maybe you can elaborate a bit on this. Is what are the asks that you have for service providers or for the research community that would help to uh, to evaluate, improve, uh, advance uh, these efforts that you're pursuing? I um I was a this is just a dream, and I know it's uh, hard to get to, but. The absolute best thing would be, at least in in the clinical trials and observational trials, would be uh, um, a feature that really um, um, captures the outcomes mm -hmm. in a good way, in a, in a way where the outcomes are categorized, and so that it's really easy to track. Is this outcome the same as the outcome reported yeah uh, so that you can just get an overview of okay these are the 10 outcomes and what happened to the 10 outcomes later during the process um now um now it's really hard to it that that goes for all the different registries it's really hard to see okay is this published outcome what this is it this outcome or not it's uh I've done this a couple of hundred times in in the trial I I mentioned it's it's so confusing it's so hard to really get yeah. to is it the same uh, outcome or not so right. that would be of great help yeah cuz the format of a paper doesn't correspond at all necessarily to the structure of a pre-registration and so no. the mapping yeah. becomes very difficult that's and it's also easy you can write the same outcome in different ways in the pre-registration template as well so yeah you could do that in a number of different ways. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll have a solution for you in the relatively near future, because on our roadmap is an outcome reporting format, which would mirror the pre-registration format. Mm -hmm. 
And then what users do is just say, well, this was what was planned and this is what happened. This is what was yeah. planned. This is what happened. This is what planned. And so that should be easy to export for that kind of discovery. Yeah. Uh, but that actually is related to a question I see in the chat from Crystal is, is there any experience that you have yet of whether grantees are taking advantage of updating their pre-registration as the reality of research yeah. uh, appears? Are are they submitting revisions to their, here's what I plan, but here's an update, here's an update, here's an update, even before they know the outcome? Yeah, um, I don't have the complete overview, but um, uh, I've checked a, a number of times and there are definitely updates to the pre-registry mm -hmm. and you can see it very very clearly if they have updated or or not so that's that's a really good thing and yeah i believe it's it's useful for us as a funder and it's also very useful for researchers out there that's great and we demand just to say that we demand that all our projects register openly so it's not an option to keep it embargoed yeah yeah Okay. Yeah. So that is, if people aren't familiar with the service, there's the option to embargo the registration for up to four years so that if there's concerns about others seeing the ideas or uh, otherwise, uh, that doesn't happen. But most users, even those not required to, it's something like 70% uh, of registrations are public uh, as they're registered. Uh, Nick Gibson has a follow-up uh, question of hearing whether you found any advantages in terms of monitoring and evaluation for having all of the funded research in a single registry rather than allowing researchers to register wherever uh, they would like to do it. Yeah, it's uh, that's a, a lot better. It's uh, just easier to get an overview of the ongoing projects. Uh, that was a nightmare before and it was hard to to uh, yeah just get the overview so i would really recommend that and it's uh it's a small cost to pay both to get be able to gather the project but also just to be able to have uh, have the option to screen the screen the the pre-registrations before they go public um so yeah, so that's a really good, um, yeah, uh, good option. And you and then you get also you get messages when, when all when they start uh, start registering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And the other potential benefits I would imagine I don't know if you've experienced them is then consistency and training. Like researchers that don't know what to do, you don't have to train them on yeah. seventeen yeah. different ways of doing it. It's like this is the approach that we do it, and this is we can give you feedback. Uh, and then likewise, the standards for being able to evaluate, you, you can have it, you have an expected structure that the information will come in for you, for the person you mentioned uh, that checks all of these. I suspect yeah. that would be another uh, benefit. That's uh, of great help as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a limited number of uh, templates that uh, they can use. So it's, uh, uh, it's all that makes it also easier. Okay. Yeah, that's great. A uh, question from Blaine uh, is wondering if researchers that you've seen so far that now have gotten into the registry, are they also using other features of the OSF that are attached to the registry, such as adding uh, data or materials to their yeah. projects, of connecting a preprint of their paper once it is they, they finish yeah. their work? Maybe it's too early for that. Uh, no, uh, they they do. Um I think that's that's one of the things that we'll have to uh, make sure happens more often. But they some some of them they do use it like that. So uh, and we also demand uh, sharing data. So uh, it's uh, we of course prefer they share the data in the OSF registry. So we have to when a lot of the projects start finishing we will we will demand that and also we keep 10 percent of our funding mm. um uh, until they do the end report and at the end report we will demand them sharing data and doing all that uh, kind of uh, things so but none of our projects have Reached been uh, going to the end report yet okay so but uh keeping 10 percent of the money 
uh, is a great motivator for doing things like that. <laughs> yeah. And have you worked through, I know you're not there yet. Have you worked through those scenarios where they've said, well, we haven't published it yet. Do we really need to share our data now? And we're still working on the papers. Uh, yeah. What's the requirement going to be? Um, so we haven't decided on that yet, but I uh, we will demand uh, sharing the results within 12 months after uh, ending data collection. So um, uh, regardless of if they've published or not. Okay. Right. So uh, we haven't done that yet, but that's that's a part of our new yeah. uh, open science policy. Right. Uh, Nadia, are there other questions or other contexts that you want to make sure that we cover before we sure. wrap today? I actually have a question, which is maybe a bigger picture question about other funders in Norway. So um, I know you're you're quite a large one, but are you seeing uh, other funders, smaller funders, um, other research organizations kind of look to this work that you're doing with uh, registration um, as part of your workflow and changing their workflows? Or what has the kind of conversation been like um, in response to these requirements that you have? Um, so uh, we've been able to, since we're we're fairly big, but we're still fairly small, we're just 13 people and we can do things very, uh, we don't have huge decision-making processes that are cumbersome. So we decide on things very uh, fast. And so trying out the two-stage process is one thing. We have um, we also have an, uh, two programs that have uh, a running process where you can submit your paper at any time and get it reviewed within 20 days. And you get your answer within 20 days. Uh, and it never the funds are never emptied. So it's always running. So this it goes on over the year as well. So it's it's never empty. Uh, and we have this registered report and pre-registration uh, at the OSF. So other funders are looking to uh, what we do, and they've started copying the two-stage process and the running process. And the Norwegian Research Council has said, we're, we're looking at what happens with the registered report. Um, uh, project to see if that's something that we should do as well. So they're definitely looking uh, to what we uh, we do and are interested, but they're they want some results uh, coming in as well. Yeah, yeah, they're all the, so the many. Please, yeah, the project uh, that you are doing, uh, looking at the the benefit of pre registrations. Uh, I'm not. Uh, can't remember the name of the project. There are um, a few different ones, but yeah, we have uh, one where we're doing a trial of looking at registration and registered reports as well. Yeah. Um, that may be. So I, I think projects like that will really move yeah. things, uh, things forward. Yeah. yeah. And there's a burgeoning meta science research community that's really interrogating these topics uh, with a variety of different approaches, a real, a real, you know, global community now. And so I yeah. think there's, there's a healthy dialogue uh, to happen between fundamental research of whether these ideas are meeting their promise. And those yeah. uh, like you, they're sort of pushing the boundaries of what might we try, what we try experimentally. And then if the, those things that work, other funders, other journals, other communities may then say, ah, we have some confidence that uh, we can adopt these uh, and gain the benefits. Yeah. Mm. That, yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, we're trying to just uh, test something and see uh, how it lands and, yeah, build build our processes on research done by others like you. Yeah. Great. Well, there, let me try to get the one more question in from the chat before we uh, close. And uh, Nick Gibson asks another one, which is a fundamental one for registered reports, uh, which is if we're going, if a journal is going to commit in advance uh, to publishing these regardless of outcomes, it creates an interesting challenge for types of research where the research process is sequential. Like the, mm. what I do in my second study is contingent on what happened in the first study. And so is there a mechanism yet, or have you had any experience with this uh, to 
provide some ways of uh, enabling sequential types of research through that registered report model? Uh, no, that's it. We get a lot of questions about that. So um, uh, I don't have an answer to that other than uh, we, we're really in now we're just giving the the choice to to the applicants. Not, yes. Yeah. So we have we have said these are the requirements. Your project has to end up in one publication. Yeah. Uh, and your project has to be you, you have to publish it in one of these 300 plus journals that you have mentioned on your website. Uh, and they have to choose, can okay. they do it or not? And then we will see yeah. what kind of questions we get and, uh, and what um, obstacles they face on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this will be an interesting thing for the evolution of registered reports. There are several papers uh, using the registered reports models that have multiple experiments. Most commonly, it's the capstone experiment uh, that is the registered report and the yeah. others are preliminary exploratory work to sort of build the case for doing that. There are some that are several experiments where they were all put through the registered report process. My anecdotal observation of those is that they are independent enough experiments that they're all sort of converging on a similar hypothesis. And so they all test it in a different way. So it's yeah. fine to propose them together as sort of the cumulative evidence uh, yeah. for that. So it'll be interesting in, in your process to see how many of those that are planning in that way choose the uh, route of registered reports. Yeah, I just want to add that we uh, previously we've funded a lot of PhD projects. Mm -hmm. And so we get a lot of questions that is this suitable for PhD projects? And our answer is yes, it's suitable, but it's not suitable probably now to choose it at the pre-proposal level. So you can still publish your re research that way, but it's it's hard for us to say that th this will be, yeah. uh, this will end, it, it can't like we've done it now, end up in three different uh, publications that, and that's a requirement uh, by Norwegian law uh now okay so uh and w huh. we believe that that's that's inviting uh slicing your data and uh, pulling the project apart so it's uh that's something we're working on uh, politically as well yeah. yeah well that is a great <clears throat> uh illustration to end on which is science is a social system and there are many different factors that are influencing the actions of any given researcher the national context, policies that may not have even thought about what the potential implications would be of if you require three and they do one big project, they're going to find a way to turn it into three, uh, even mm. if that's the expense uh, of uh, the quality uh, and reporting of the work. So all of this effort uh, that you and others are uh, committed to doing to improve the quality of research has to be in constant dialogue uh, with those other actors, other funders, other publishers, the researchers themselves, so that we can keep sort of converging to what's actually working here, uh, what isn't working, and that iterative experience uh, improving along the way. So we just really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing uh, and your willingness to talk uh, with us about it today to give us a sense of uh, what sort of the progressive end uh, of these reforms are like to maybe inspire the others uh, to try out some things or maybe even reach out to you and say, what about this? <laughs> what about mm -hmm. that? Uh, what do you think would work or not? So thank you, uh, Jan Ola, and thank you everybody for the questions that you offered today.